Welcome to using maximum likelihood estimation to calibrate a discrete time Markov model. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Previous examples have been leading to the implementation of a functional discrete time Markov model for the succession dynamics of a small set of plant categories in a simplified desert plant community. An aspect of this modeling effort that remains for us to explore is the development of a technique for calibrating the Markov model. In particular, we need to have a way of measuring or estimating the nine transition probability parameters that make up the entries of the transition matrix. A technique for accomplishing this task is the subject of this video. Our technique relies upon parameter estimation in general and maximum likelihood estimation in particular. And in order to illustrate how it works, we'll revisit our ongoing example on desert plant communities that was inspired by McAuliffe's paper. In order to calibrate our stationary discrete time Markov model from previous examples, we have to find a way to collect data that can be used to estimate values of the nine unknown parameters in our transition matrix. These are the entries P11, P12, P13, and so on that are shorthand for representing the probabilities P of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 given x sub t equals 1, p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1 given x sub t equals 2, and so on. A natural choice for an observation we can make of our vegetation succession is a time series of the vegetation categories that dominate the landscape. We've already seen how to simulate just such a time series, but the following is another example that spans 50 time steps and was sampled from our transition probability distributions. In practice, we would imagine that these would be actual physical observations of the dominant state at a sequence of given times that our, our landscape is, is sitting in. So we might ask, what is the probability of observing this time series? In other words, can we derive a likelihood function for it? And so again, the time series that we're looking at represents the dominant states at a sequence of given times. So this particular realization involves a long sequence of threes, which represents bare ground, followed by a shorter sequence of ones, which represents shrubs, and then a sequence of bare ground again, and then more shrubs, and then some grasses, and so on. Now, different sequences of observations of our landscape are going to lead to different realizations of the time series. The numbers within it are going to be different. And the same can be true, or the same can be said, for different simulations of those sequences of observations. However, all of the different realizations of the time series should have similar statistical characteristics, and it's those characteristics that we're going to use in order to estimate our unknown parameters. Recall that our model is a stationary discrete time Markov model. Therefore, two things are true about our time series. The probability of transitioning to a future state depends only on the current state and not on any other past states. This is the Markov property. Also, the probability of transitioning from the current state to the next depends only on the current state and not the absolute time that the state is observed at. This reflects the fact that the model is stationary. Now, since Pij represents the probability of making a transition from state j to state i, we can form a likelihood function for any sequence of state observations that we've made like the one that we saw in the previous slide. We would simply need to work our way down the sequence and form a product of those transition probabilities each time we see a transition from some state j to state i we insert that probability pij into the product. And we're looking at the specific example of what the likelihood function would look like for the time series that we are pretending that we've gone out and collected from our landscape that was displayed on the previous, previous slides. Now, some terms in the middle of this product have been omitted for brevity, but we can actually shorten that product a little bit with notation. If we let Nij 
represent the transition counts or the number of times a state j is followed immediately by a state i in the time series, then we can use that. We can use that to shorten our likelihood function. Because what we need to re recognize is that our likelihood function is just a product of a bunch of pijs. So for each transition probability, let's take p11 for instance, we would go through our sequence and count the number of times that there was a transition from state one at one time step to state one at the next time step. That count would be n11. And the first term in our product, the first factor in our product, would be p11 raised to the power of n11. Then we'd look for p12. How many times did we make a transition from state two back to state one? Well, that's going to be n12 and we would insert a p12 to the n12 in our product. And we follow that until we cover all possible transition probabilities, and the result is our likelihood function. So if we were to analyze our particular time series, the transition counts, if we were to arrange them into rows and columns, just like we did with our transition probabilities, would be 11, 3, and 2 along the first row. Those are n11, n12, n13, 3, 6, and 0 for n21, n22, and n23, and then so on. So using those values, we could construct the following likelihood function of p11 to the 11, p12 to the 3, times p13 squared, times p21 cubed, times p22 to the 6th power, times p23 to the 0th power, times p31 squared, times p32 to the 0th power, times p33 to the 23rd power. Now this function depends only on the nine parameters, pij. So we ought to be able to maximize it relative to them. Essentially, we would need to apply the maximum likelihood estimation technique to those nine parameters. It takes a fair amount of theoretical work in order to establish the exact formulas for the maximum likelihood estimates of the transition probabilities coming from our likelihood function. We're not going to go into those theoretical details because they require more calculus than is necessary to get into for our purposes right now. Later we will introduce the statement of a theorem that states our estimates formally, but for now the maximum likelihood estimates for the transition probabilities can be computed simply from the transition counts of the Markov chain that we've observed, and they're given by the following formula. Each transition probability pij, so the probability of transitioning from state j to state i, is given by the corresponding transition count in ij divided by the sum of transition counts starting in state j going to all other possible states. And so our, in our context, this means that we can tr estimate the transition matrix for our Markov chain by dividing the elements within each column of in ij by its corresponding column sum. Specifically, this approach yields the following estimates for our transition probabilities. P11 is about 0.6875, P12 is 0.3333, P13 is 0 0.0800, P21 is 0.1875, P22 is 0.6667, P23 is 0, P31 is 0 0.1250, P32 is 0, and P33 is 0.92. In our case, we can actually assess the quality of our estimate pretty readily because we actually know the true values of the transition probabilities for the system that generated our time series. They are the transition probabilities that we used to simulate a Markov chain time series in previous examples, and we just use them to simulate a new time series for this example. So those probabilities are P11 is 0.7, P12 is 0.25, P13 is 0.11, P21 is 0.14, P22 is 0.63, 
P23 is 0.04, P31 is 0.16, P32 is 0.12, and P33 is 0.85. And at least roughly speaking, in a quantitative sense, the estimates aren't too terribly far off from the true values. But they're not that great either. There's some significant differences, and we might ask, well, what can we do about that? So we'll drive this point home a little bit. We'll consider or compare the true transition probability values stored in the matrix P side by side with the estimated transition probability values stored in the matrix P hat. And we can see that P hat and P are at least qualitatively, if not somewhat quantitatively similar. But at best, we probably can only get away with stating that our estimate is rough. We could expect to improve our estimate if we collected more data. This is what we always do in the parameter estimation problem if we're hoping to improve an estimate. One way of doing that would mean to observe or collect a longer time series of observations. However, there could be a real practical limitation to this approach. For example, suppose we are only able to make an observation of the dominant vegetation category in the landscape once each year. In that case, our time series that we already have would represent 50 years of observations. If you plan to exceed that by even just one order of magnitude, then your study must span several human generations. This would be pretty costly and unlikely to survive the typical attention span of most research efforts. Luckily, there's a solution. Another thing we could do is divide the landscape into a lattice or even a linear transect made up of multiple observation sites, not just one big site for the entire landscape. We would want to ensure that each observation site is, at least approximately, independent of the others over time by spacing them sufficiently far apart. We would then collect simultaneous time series of observations at all of the sites. For example, we would collect a sequence of just five observations, but maybe at 500 different sites. The first few in the last time series in their data set of this character is summarized in the following table. So what our table is going to look like in practice is one that's got 500 rows to it. Each row represents a time series of observations taken at one of the different sites that's uniquely identified with some identification number, a site ID. So the first site has a time series of 2, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, representing that initially the site was dominated by grasses. It continued to be in year one, continued to be in year two after that, continued to be in year three after that, and then it transitioned back to shrubs for two more years. And the different sites had their own behavior. We'll take the following steps in order to describe how to apply maximum likelihood estimation of our transition probabilities to data that's in this particular format. We'll compute the transition counts, Nij, at each site. And then once we've got a set of transition counts, essentially for each row, each time series in our data set, we'll just pool them by summing like transition counts together. Then once we have our pooled transition counts in IJ, we'll compute P hat as an estimator to P as before, using the same formula we saw before. Each transition probability is equal to the corresponding transition count divided by the column sum of transition counts for the column that our transition probability is representing. Our five-year study of observations taken at 500 independent sites distributed throughout the landscape would produce the following estimate for the transition matrix. And as we can see, P hat contains values that are much closer to the true values that appeared in P.
P11 is 0.688, P12 is 0.2509, P13 is 0.1166 along the first row. And if we compare those to 0 0.7, 0 0.25, and 0 0.11, it's usually only the second or third decimal place where we start seeing divergence from the true values. And similar behavior appears along the other rows as well. This is quite a bit more accurate than our first estimate, and it involved a much more reasonable time period of study, just five years. The takeaway here is that if it is possible, and you're willing, to collect time series of moderate length from a reasonably large network of independent observation sites, you have the potential to estimate a transition matrix much more accurately than you could if you had collected data from a single site over a longer interval. What we've essentially done here is gone from collecting 50 years worth of single state observations to the equivalent of five years times 500 or 2,500 uh, transition counts. That's what we've bought by working over a network of observation sites even though it only takes us five years to collect that data. If we had wanted this kind of accuracy, yet we're only willing or able to collect data one year at a time at a single observation site in the landscape, then that would have required the equivalent of 2,500 years worth of data. And in many cases, it's just simply not feasible to obtain data like that. So this was a vast improvement in this particular application. Finally, we'll summarize our work today by establishing the maximum likelihood estimate formula for a Markov transition matrix in generality. That way we could apply our results to other similar modeling efforts that have nothing to do with the desert plant community example we've been tracking. So if we let x equal the time series x0, x1, x2, all the way up through xm. It represents a sequence of observations of a discrete random variable that draws values from a sample space omega of finite cardinality k. In other words, x sub i belongs to omega for each value of i, ranging from 0 to 1 to 2 all the way up to m. If x is an observation of a chain from a discrete time Markov model, then the entries pij of the transition matrix for the model have the following maximum likelihood estimate. pij is approximately equal to the corresponding transition count nij, or number of times we observed a transition from state j to state i in our time series, divided by the column sum of transition counts for that particular set of transitions starting at state j. The proof of the theorem requires a little bit of multivariable calculus that we won't be going into here. The statement of the theorem is what's important. It tells us that we can generalize the techniques we saw in the previous examples to essentially any scenario in which we can observe a system transition from state to state over time and we believe the system of approximately satisfies the Markov property. At this stage, we've explored the steps of the SIAM modeling process as they apply to the desert plant communities example, except for analysis and model assessment and reporting the results. The technological companion to this video lesson will explore the implementation details of computing the estimator for the transition matrix in MATLAB. We'll see that in an upcoming video. That brings us to the end of this video lesson, however, and I hope you found it useful. Thank you for watching, and hopefully you'll be able to join us for the next video lessons.